Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to today's uh, discussion on building collaboration and the, the question of repair. I'm Professor Malo Hudson, and I'm also the director of the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab within the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia University. Today's discussion will be the first of many on a very important topic uh, about how within the university do you build real relationships and partnerships that are based on ethical principles, uh, trust, that are long lasting and actually effective. Uh, I prepared a few remarks today before I introduce our two panelists, uh, just to frame the discussion. So bear with me as I read this, and then I will go into the introduction of our panelists. I first want, want to start off by thanking uh, Dean Amal Andraus, who has been incredibly supportive of the work we've been trying to do within the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab, as well as more broadly, the leadership she's shown without, uh, throughout GSAP in terms of us uh, being more outwardly thinking uh, and, and taking our research and scholarship and try to apply, uh, apply it to address some of society's most pressing issues. I, this event also wouldn't be possible without the great work of Lila Cartier, who works uh, closely with all the faculty, staff, and students to ensure that we have high quality programming that we hope to, you will enjoy today. Um, again, I wanna thank everyone for attending this event. Although, the, although this discussion is one that has been happening at the university for decades, Today's event is at, at the right time in our history and ideal as we celebrate Black History Month. Given the growing challenges we face, it is appropriate that GSAP host this conversation. We are at a critical moment in our society when institutions matter a great deal and universities are among some of the most important institutions. Universities have, have the potential to play a unique and positive role in helping to usher, usher in positive societal change. Universities can bring students, faculty, and staff from every corner of the world together. They hold the possibility of embracing difference and be a venue for debate, discussion, and learning. They may offer cutting edge new ideas, challenge the status quo, and push for human rights, as well as social, economic, and environmental justice. Unfortunately, universities have not always lived up to their potential. Many of the oldest and most elite universities in the United States were built by enslaved laborers. They have also been places of exclusion, racism, and white supremacy. They have been a part of massive land acquisitions leading to the displacement of Black, Latinx, and other people of color from the surrounding communities. Columbia is no exception. In Sharon Sutton's book, When Ivory Towers Were Black, she documents the role of Columbia University as the mega builder in the heart of Harlem, which by 1961 had, a, had announced a $68 million expansion plan, including $8 million for a gymnasium that was to be built in Morningside Park. This sparked outrage and major protests from the community as well as others. Columbia's Manhattanville development has been controversial, further highlighting the need for repair and healing between the university and the broader Harlem community. In recent years, Columbia has begun facing its past wrongs is striving to do better. President Bollinger has called on the university to focus on the fourth purpose, a commitment to strengthen Columbia's capacity to connect its scholarship and teaching so that it has impact on pressing real world problems. This ignited conversations across the campus about the importance of partnership, collaboration, implementation, and ethics. The timing couldn't be better. This past year, we have witnessed New York City battle a global pandemic that has, a, that has had a disproportionate negative impact on Black, Latinx, and vulnerable, vulnerable populations, leading to higher death rates and creating an economic crisis for hundreds of thousands of workers, especially frontline workers who, are, who in New York City are overwhelmingly people of color. The pandemic has left individuals and families struggling to pay their rent and mortgages, purchase medicine, and keep food in the refrigerator. Small businesses have closed. Now there are reports that the, that the coronavirus vaccine distribution has bypassed the same communities that were the most devastated. The pandemic has exposed the spatial inequality within our cities, the unequal distribution of resources and the inequities in our healthcare system. The persistent and pervasive gender inequality in our society where women are paid much less than men in the workplace and are taking on the majority of work inside the home as caregivers and educators. And the profound inequalities, inequities in our educational system 
where the least well-off children are struggling to learn and find support. This past summer, the city also saw the swelling support for the Black Lives Matter social movement to confront anti-Black racism and racism in general, and to pr protest police brutality and the murder of Black and brown bodies. George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Philando Castillo. The complete list is too long, making me feel both infuriated and heartbroken. All of these historic events has led to community residents, students, faculty, staff, alumni, university leaders, and friends of the university to call on Columbia to do more. The university now more than ever needs to live up to its potential to break down its walls, root out deep-seated racism, strive to address societal inequities, and find ways to build collaboration and repair the damage it has done in the past. As President Bollinger said in his statement on Columbia's commitment to anti-racism on July 21st, quote, Columbia is an old institution by the standards of the United States, and it has its share of shameful periods and moments of great progress. I hope we can collectively add to the latter. Across the university, there are many people reflecting on what can be done. President Bollinger's uh, quote that I just, that I just uh, read to you is part of the spirit of today's discussion and key questions. How can Columbia and GSAP in collaboration with community partners more effectively address pressing societal challenges? What is happening now at Columbia and GSAP to repair previous actions that have caused harm in the greater community? What opportunities exist to do more to build long lasting, ethical and effective partnerships with, the commu with community partners, which can lead to the co-production of knowledge? Given the complex issues facing us as urban planners, architects, urban designers, and public health practitioners, we must stand up and make a difference. So thank you very much for that. Now I'd like to introduce our two panelists. I'll read their bios and, and we'll jump into the presentations. Our first panelist is Akila King. Akila King is the CEO of Room to Grow, whose mission is to offer structured coaching, material goods, and community connections to support parents as they activate their natural strength and expand their knowledge so children thrive from the start. Ms. King joined Room to Grow in 2015 and has held several roles in the areas of program operations, external relations, and evaluation. Ms. King was appointed Executive Director of Room to Grow New York in June 2018 and CEO in 2020. With a deep desire to achieve health equity for all families and local communities, Ms. King began her career in research at the renowned Hospital for for special surgery in the New York City and its affiliated nonprofit, the Foundation of Orthopedics and Complex Spine. While at FOCOS, Ms. King gained extensive fundraising and development experience and was a member of the team that opened the first modern ortho orthopedic hospital in West Africa. Ms. King holds a master's in public health from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and a BA from Brown University. Ms. King is an alum of the Princeton Alumni Corps Emerging Leaders Program and currently serves as the executive uh, on the executive board of veteran mental health nonprofit operation, uh, Operation Hill Our Heroes. Ms. King, welcome. Our second panelist is Mr. Flores Forbes. He is an associate vice president for community affairs in the Office of Government and Community Affairs at Columbia University and an adjunct associate professor within the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. He is a writer, urban planner, an economic development expert. Mr. Forbes has practiced urban planning, city planning as a land use expert, community development and real estate developer, planning and building thousands of affordable housing units in lower Manhattan and Harlem. He is also the author of two books on urban planning issues and race. His most recent publication, Invis Invisible Men, a contemporary slave narrative in the era of mass incarceration, won the 2017 American Book Award for nonfiction. His first book, Will You Die With Me? My Life in the Black Panther Party, chronicles his life and transformation from an urban guerrilla to an urban planner. As an economic development expert, Mr. Forbes has been involved with providing technical assistance to small businesses and nonprofits over the years. His focus at Columbia University for the past 12 years has been urban planning, entrepreneurship, and small business development, criminal justice change, and community development. 
He has lectured on urban planning and economic development and criminal justice change at Columbia, Stetson University, Colorado College, NYU, Howard University, and the City University of New York. He holds a Bachelor of Arts, Interdisciplinary Studies of, of the Social Science from San Francisco State University, and a Master's of Urban Planning from the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service at New York University. He has also been a Patricia Roberts Harris Fellow and a Charles H. Revson Fellow. So I want to welcome Mr. Flores. Uh, why don't we start with Ms. King? Thanks, Malo. It's a pleasure and an honor to be invited to this conversation um, alongside Flores. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing more about Room to Grow, our partnership and work with Columbia and some of my reflections uh, over the last several years. Um, so I'm gonna share my slides here. Great, so as Malo so beautifully read, uh, here is our mission here at Room to Grow. Essentially, we partner with low-income families um, in an effort to close the socioeconomic achievement gap for young kids ages zero to three. Uh, and so we provide three critical types of supports, uh, and that is parenting, coaching, community connections, and material goods. We partner with families when mom is in her third trimester. We really try to uh, envision ourselves as a very upstream model, um, and families stay with, uh, stay with us in the program until the child is three years old, coming in for quarterly visits. Uh, each of these visits are two hours long. Um, and the first hour, we're really diving into our parenting curriculum. We're talking about child development. We're talking about routines, all of the messy things that come with parenting. Um, and we truly see ourselves as a two-generation model. So we're not only focusing on the child, but the needs of the parent as well. Uh, and we're setting short-term and long-term goals with our families. What really makes our model quite unique is outside of this traditional coaching or therapeutic work, we have baby boutiques uh, in all of our locations. Uh, so for the second hour of the session, we move out into the floor and this is really an attempt to help close um, gaps on material hardship, um, but also to extend that first hour uh, and talk about uh, strategies and activities to help promote growth and development at the home. So we're co-selecting books, toys, clothing, equipment. If we're talking about fine motor skills in that first hour, we may pull out a puzzle and model some activities um, for the parents. And the idea is that families uh, are leaving with the knowledge, skills, and the resources they need to really create this thriving environment. Uh, and then the last pillar of our model is community connections. Um, and so in an effort to help families achieve their long-term and sh short-term goals, we pull in other resources and other partners in the community. Um, and these include early intervention, they might be mental health referrals. We have dentists, we're trying to help families find quality healthcare. It really is um, a wide range of partners that we can call upon. Uh, and since COVID, we've had to adapt our model. Uh, so right now we are virtual. Our families are engaging with our clinical program team over FaceTime, over the phone. Um, and uh, we're finding that although uh, we don't really get a chance to observe child and parent interaction as well as we could in, in person, we are still having rigorous and in-depth conversations with our families. They know what this time is for. It's preserved to really talk about their child development. Um, someone to talk to uh, and really continue to brainstorm with our clinical team on how to um, support uh, their families during these challenging times. Uh, and then in addition to the FaceTime work, we are sending bundles uh, of our clothing to our families. So these are some photos of, of the kids there. And as I uh, tee us up for a conversation around our partnership work, I just wanted to share uh, you know, some of the uh, demographic statistics of our families, 100% are low income. Um, and we have about 50% who are single parents. You do not have to be a single or a first time parent to participate uh, in our program. And you know, another uh, stat to highlight here is 95% of our, our families um, or parents are of color. I'm about to talk a little bit about our evaluation because this is where our partnership work with Columbia really comes to a head. But I just wanted to quickly share that we think about evaluation holistically. So we're looking at the parent, child, the family, and the community. Um, and our strategy really includes 
yes, case management and curriculum data that um, we complete uh, via electronic forms, externally validated tools um, that are used widely in early childhood field or mental health field. Uh, and then we have our gold star academic research partners. Um, and that is where Columbia uh, comes into play. Um, and so room to grow, we are, um, three years into a randomized controlled trial in partnership with Teachers College and the School of Social Work. Uh, and it really is to assess the impact of our, of our program model. The story is that, uh, you know, we had two top researchers out of uh, Teachers College uh, and School of Social Work who for years have been talking about, it would be great to understand the material uh, effects and material hardship when it comes to low-income families and young kids. And we had another research partner who was really looking to see um, the impact of uh, parenting uh, curriculum and a parenting program and what if there was an organization or program that uh, did both. And uh, we happened to meet. Um, and so they were happy to jump on board and really help um, build and design and implement this study with us. Um, and then the other partnership to note is uh, we are a project listed in the Columbia World Projects Initiative. Um, and so Mallow kind of uh, talked about the, the fourth purpose that President Bollinger has laid out. And I think this is really, um, you know, bringing that uh, fourth purpose uh, to, to light. Um, and so we are working with the Columbia World Projects team to continue and expand our current research um, but also there is uh, hopefully an opportunity um, for CWP to partner with us as we think about growth and expansion of the room to grow model. You know, I've, uh, I've had many reflections over the years about, uh, you know, partnership work um, in particular with, uh, you know, Columbia and Malo really emphasized to be really honest and forthcoming. And so here are just some of my thoughts and, um, you know, I say all of this with uh, a grain of salt because our partnership with Columbia over the years has been quite fantastic. Um, but these are some things that really uh, are top of mind. And the first is, uh, you know, an organization like Room to Grow, um, we are a living, breathing organism. Um, I threw business on this slide because often it is forgotten that a nonprofit is in fact active business uh, and sometimes in partnership work especially with um, you know funders or, or institutions uh, you know we can be referred to quite explicitly and deduced to a project um, you know and for us this is our everyday work right we're talking about the livelihood of not only program participants um, but also our team um, and you know while there is potential and opportunity in our model um, you know, if for us, we're not just a sandbox uh, for experimentation. Um, and, you know, it's something that I always try to bring to the forefront, you know, and with a business such as ours comes uh, real business problems. Uh, there are financial and political dynamics on the day to day. Uh, and when it comes down to it, keeping the lights on uh, comes first. Um, and that also includes team retention and ensuring high quality programming. Um, and, you know, one thing that I, uh, I always think about is making sure that we are in the driver's seat of our own destiny. Um, when I feel like there maybe is a threat from a community partner, always coming back um, to that question. Uh, my second bullet here is internal expertise in collab collaborative design and development. And this is really just speaking upon, um, you know, making sure that we really have a seat at the table when it comes to partnership work. Uh, we are on the ground every day. Uh, we know our community, we know our families, we know our work, and we, we have something to add. Um, and uh, we are fortunate enough to be invited to, to work with some of the most brilliant minds in the country or in the world. Um, but remembering that we have something to offer too. Um, and that together, if we, you know, really design and develop, whether it's a study or a project collaboratively, uh, it, it really can be the best of both worlds and result in a project or a deliverable um, that is not only comprehensive, um, but something that could actually be uh, implementable, at the, uh, implementable at the end of the, end of the day. Um, I also 
really feel like it's important to talk about the elephant in the room. And that is the power of funding. Um, when you are partnering with an institution like Columbia that has money, uh, it is easy for a, a nonprofit who, you know, there is really a culture around always fundraising and scrapping um, to, to feel beholden um, uh, to that partner. Um, and, you know, we were just talking about this before the uh, session got started that, you know, it can result in tensions and identity crisis. Um, and I think it's really important for uh, any funder um, that uh, has a lot of financial uh, power to realize that um, it can cloud our thinking um, it can lead to internal organizational fractions. Um, and, uh, you know, it really is uh, a, a driver uh, and an incentive that can, can throw work off course. Um, and I think the most important thing that we can do is acknowledge and talk about those power dynamics should they start to bubble. Uh, and then last but not least, and I think this is probably the direction of the rest of the conversation is just reflecting on the history of research in communities of color uh, and this note of collective efficacy. Um, and I know many on this call probably know more about the research than I do, um, but it's important for us as an organization um, to, to build trust with our families, our model and our work literally depends on it. Um, and then when you bring in research partners who are interacting um, with our families, especially, I, I spoke about the 94% um, of our families are of color. I, I think it's important for us to stop and talk about um, the history and the dynamic uh, when it comes to um, people of color interacting and in, uh, uh, in, in participating in research. Um, it is known to be a research, uh, a barrier to research um, by uh, particularly uh, with blacks. Um, and you know, that stems from historic events, um, but also I think it's exacerbated by uh, socioeconomics and other system inequities. Um, and I hope to do more of this in the future, not just in partnership with Columbia, but just in the everyday work of Room to Grow, of really bringing in the community in not only our work, but our projects um, and having uh, or achieving true collective efficacy um, and uh, making sure that our families um, are really bought into the work um, and our, our goal of, um, achieving common good. Uh, and I can talk more about the ways in which we are doing that, but I wanted to highlight that. Um, and that's it for my presentation. I'm looking forward to uh, answering any questions and, and indulging in further conversation. Thank you so much for that. I mean, you gave us a lot to think about in terms of <clears throat> not being reduced to a project. Uh, we're not a sandbox for experimentation. Uh, asking for a seat at the table and certainly highlighting the issues around the power of funding. So many things for us to dive into, you said, uh, gave us a lot to think about and certainly uh, also around the issues of collective efficacy. So now that we've heard uh, the perspective from an outside entity, uh, let's hear what it's like from someone who sits more at the seat of power, if you will, or closer to the decision-making process of Columbia University. And let's hear from Mr. Forbes, how do you approach your work? and uh, sort of navigating both spaces, not only a researcher, but also as part of the administration. Uh, okay, great. Uh, thanks, Milo and uh, Akila. You know, that was some great information uh, to get. And I uh, appreciate this forum um, to talk about some of the work that we are doing uh, at the university. So I'm, I'm gonna briefly talk about a project that I'm working on at the moment that is part of my focus as an urban planner who is an administrator at an urban university like Columbia. So more broadly, it can be called, you know, the surrounding communities, organizing internally, the outward facing intellectual capital of the university and how we can help with regards to economic development, workforce and education in the Harlem community. So this collaboration uh, as it stands uh, involves specifically Columbia Business School, the School of Social Work, Columbia Law School, the Data Science uh, in, uh, Institute, Central Administration of the University, the trustees, and many departments and staff here at uh, Columbia University. 
So let's reflect on what happened this past summer, beginning with a deeply disturbing image of a black man being lynched by a police officer on national TV. You know, and I think that that affected people to the point of, you know, if you look back at the black and white photos of crowds of white men standing around smiling, pointing up at a lynched man in a tree. And, uh, you know, that was on a picture. This was national television, where you could see the nonchalance of this officer, you know, which is this manifestation of white supremacy, which embeds all police departments. So I think it was shocking. And I think that this is what triggered this, this particular moment. So the, the image of George Floyd followed by the protests affected many, but especially here at Columbia University. And then there was the pandemic, which was a real black swan to the economy that has devastated our surrounding communities. So as a result, President Bollinger on July 21st, 2020, sent out a charge or a challenge to the Columbia University community, calling for us to do better and work at ending anti-Black racism and focus on racial justice. So several efforts were created via a task force to look at staff experience, public safety, images and monuments, recruitment of African-American, Afro-Latino students, staff, faculty, and how we can help the surrounding communities with a focus on African-Americans and Afro-Latinos. Now I'm on that task force and involved with several areas, but for this, aspect of building collaboration, I will focus on the Harlem community. First, after reviewing the existing conditions with regards to what we do in the community, I saw that our strongest work was in Columbia Business School with the Columbia Harlem Small Business Development Center and the technical assistance and education we brought to the local small business community with probably numbers somewhere around 8,000 businesses at the time. And we decided to build and enhance with Columbia Business School as the foundation, creating an emergency loan fund for small businesses. We also made an assessment of our other assets that were outward facing, for example, the, the Community Benefits Agreement, which we uh, signed in, 20, um, in 2009 uh, as part of the uh, expansion plan in terms of building our new campus, programs for youth, education, workforce, and criminal justice change. We met with internal stakeholders and connected with each about how to work together. But we quickly realized that this was new to us because internally we were not organized, but in silos and thus needed an infrastructure to develop a project of this nature. We needed a delivery system as we worked on organizing the marketplace at Columbia University and then the community. So the research we looked at, we looked at community development corporations and I, I've had a long history of working with community development corporations. And I think for what we wanted to do, it was a very weak model. So what we also did is we explored other uh, manifestations of community development. And so we looked at the community development financial institution, which is a, uh, 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 an operation that is, um, funded or it's many ways funded and certified by the uh, US Treasury Department that, you know, and it was a way for us to also organize, create an infrastructure to organize all the other outward facing uh, operations that we have at the university. So we retained a consultant to work at this and currently we're conducting a feasibility study. And this feasibility study is allowing us to actually talk to the marketplace. We're not only talking to the marketplace internally and looking at what we actually, we're, we're looking at the marketplace as it exists today with most of the major stakeholders that are out there. It could be the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone, Harlem Community Development Corporation, most of many of the affordable housing developers and a lot of the criminal justice change groups that we're working with. So, so we're collecting that data and this feasibility study will probably be done sometime uh, in the spring. But we're also moving on two tracks, focusing on how we're going to create this entity <clears throat> and have it evolve in within the, uh, the Columbia community. So I, I think that that's a, um, you know, so it gives you a pretty good idea of, of, of what we're doing and how we look at projecting outward. And so I, you know, the study will be done in the, uh, the spring. And uh, I, I think that it's a, um, 
you know, it's, it's a worthy effort. And I think it's, it's probably one of the most important uh, organizational efforts in terms of Columbia harnessing its intellectual capital and using it to help uh, improve a uh, community that's been devastated by a pandemic. So I guess I'll stop there and uh, we'll take some questions. Yes, well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Forbes. So you highlighted it again, just like uh, Ms. King highlighted many important issues. And I think one takeaway that stuck out for me is that oftentimes we think of Columbia University as this entity that's organized. And you actually said, well, it wasn't. What you found is we're not organized we're oftentimes siloed and you're really working against that internally, not to mention needing to branch out and do other work. And I also like the fact that you highlighted some of the other work that's happening in other units, such as Columbia Business School, the Data Science Institute, uh, School of Social Work. So I'd love to talk more about that. And I'm gonna take the privilege as being the moderator as well as the presenter, but I wanted to just uh, present a little bit about what the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab I've been working on and, and sort of the focus of the lab and then we'll open it up to the broader questions. But I think it's a good uh, representation here to show you not, not only uh, from an outside uh, perspective of the university, but then also from an administrative perspective and now from the seat of a faculty member. So hopefully you all can uh, see my slides. So as I mentioned before, uh, I'm an associate professor within the Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation, I direct the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab. Much of my work is at the intersection of community development, health equity, and the circular economy, or what some people refer to as sustainability. The lab's mission is really to conduct interdisciplinary <laughs> research. So much like uh, Mr. Forbes talked about, is breaking down these silos and to work with colleagues across the Columbia campus. So I have partnered with colleagues in public health, I have numerous conversations with colleagues over in social work about things, how we can work together. I'm involved with the Columbia, Columbia Population Research Center, which brings faculty across the institution. But more importantly, how do we take our research and scholarship to really try to influence or transform institutions, whether that be nonprofit organizations, larger institutions such as Columbia, uh, and to lead to real policies and practices that, ca uh, that cause these health inequities that we see, both domestically and internationally. For the purposes of today's uh, short talk about the lab, I won't talk about my uh, global work, but I do some work in Chile around uh, disaster management and recovery. There are three real distinct research areas within the lab. One is the built environment, natural environment and health. The second is around community development in the circular economy, or as I said earlier, sustainability. And the third is law and governance. Uh, I just wanna highlight uh, some of the most recent things that uh, my colleagues and I have been doing. One has been a focus on housing and health. So my doctoral student, Carolyn Swope and I wrote a piece for, the, for this new book, con contributing author to this new book, Urban Public Health, a research, a research toolkit for practice and impact edited by our colleagues uh, down at Drexel University. Uh, we've also, I've also worked on writing a piece about urban health the Encyclopedia of Environmental Health and how do we think about approaching our work from a more holistic perspective. Uh, most recently, and literally when I say most recently, just this week, uh, the lab has received a grant from the Columbia Population Research Center to uh, do a, a study with uh, local school districts within the state of California, as well as the Commonwealth of Virginia, to look at, support, uh, look at districts, how districts have been supporting the farm to school um, effort in especially healthy eating during this COVID-19 school closures. As many of you are, I'm sure, well aware, there's a tremendous amount of food insecurity given the COVID-19 crisis that we're in, and many children and families are going without a, a steady uh, and regular meal that they, they normally may have while, while they're at school. And so uh, this will study how schools are uh, addressing that. This comes from the work that my colleagues and I, uh, uh, Moira O'Neill, have looked at with the Oakland, School, Oakland Unified School District, uh, their uh, healthy meal program. So we were involved uh, with the research that went to uh, support the new efforts by the school district to provide locally sourced food and build a central kitchen urban farm and education center. But the piece I really wanna just talk about briefly is since we're talking about collaboration, uh, for the past year, I've been involved with the Partnership for Social and Economic Mobility. And now as part of that, there's also a Social Mobility Impact Fund. This was uh, founded by the former mayor of Philadelphia, Michael Nutter, and Lisa Nutter, who's also an urban planner. And the idea really is to create this collaborative network 
focused on collective research and partnership at multiple levels. So obviously at the university level, but also understanding that in order to be effective, you have to build real partnership within communities, within government, within the private sector. And so the key partners of this uh, network are Columbia University, which is us obviously, Johnson C. Smith University, which is a historically black college and university in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the University of Pennsylvania, just uh, not far from us. As part of the partnership, uh, the social and economic mobility component of this, not talking about the impact fund just yet, but just the, the partnership for social and economic mobility, there are really four broad areas, cutting across race, gender, and geography. But one is to really understand economic hardship. As we heard Mr. Forbes talk about, this is an unprecedented time in our society. There have been, a, a, you know, people are dealing with the pandemic, we're dealing with anti-Black racism, uh, we're dealing with the economic crisis, and so all of these things uh, have obviously led to major challenges for communities. And so a big part of this work is understanding economic hardship and really connecting with the people who are being the most impacted where it's not as Ms. King earlier said, uh, it's a project or it's something to just be studied, but actually a real partnership. Also, there's a, there's a, a tremendous amount of interest in understanding how do you really uh, sustain economic stability within communities and within cities. And so there's a lot of work being done there. And then new ways to think about uh, uh, a new social safety net. As I highlighted in my introduction, the pandemic has exposed us in so many different ways. And certainly um, we know that we can do better. And so there's a big conversation of what does a new social safety net look like? What, who needs to be at the table? What needs to happen to really take advantage of the movement that we see in, in not just in the United States, but globally to really address health inequities and the broader inequities in our society. And then lastly, you can't do much of this uh, without the cost, right? And the financing behind it. So there's a big discussion about how do we do that? Uh, the partnership has decided to start with the work that's already being done at Columbia University by my colleagues Irv Garfinkel and Christopher Weimer around the Poverty Tracker. So this is a partnership with the Robin Hood Foundation, but really uh, looks at the data across uh, New York City and now expanding to Philadelphia and also into Charlotte, but to really look at these issues from a, a, a poverty lens. And then most recently, uh, this partnership has expanded to create a, a part of a uh, investment fund. So it's, a, it's an investor supported impact fund that blends social finance and traditional funding vehicles to scale effective solutions that communities have the capacity to implement. The idea is that this is something that is not just top down, but actually engages with uh, communities to come up with the ideas that could be funded to bring about real change in the community. So this is just up and running our first meeting was held at uh, University of Pennsylvania last February, actually. So we're literally a year after we began. And then you all know the rest of the story, the global pandemic hit. And so we've been just like you all been uh, meeting virtually, but they've been making quite a lot of progress. Um, I, I will just end by saying as part of this partnership, I was asked to um, think about possibilities given my own work and what the lab is trying to do. And obviously being situated within the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, uh, to maybe pitch something that could be uh, developed further and scaled up. And so one of the things that came out of a, uh, some work I had been involved in, in uh, when I was a professor at Berkeley was really how do you create an eco village or an eco community? And the idea uh, in Oakland was that if you took a whole block and you completely made that an eco uh, friendly block from the buildings, retrofitting all the buildings, uh, thinking about the energy usage, the waste water, waste usage in general, thinking about um, water, uh, transportation, so forth. What could you do and what, you know, over time, what kind of changes could you see within the community? And so a very similar idea would be how could we potentially either partner with the New York City Housing Authority or another nonprofit housing developer uh, that may be interested in retrofitting uh, buildings that need to be retrofitted and, and do it in a more sustainable, uh, holistic approach, not only on the physical aspects of the building, but also thinking about the people who actually live in the building. And so how can we create a real partnership where the local residents are part of the overall solution and the public health intervention to bring about real change? And so this is not only just about the physical and, uh, and natural environment, but it's very much about incorporating the public health component to this. So this is uh, getting started. Uh, I have uh, had a, a former student of mine within GSAP that's been doing research to help me get going. I've been meeting with uh, the fund 
partners and having conversations with colleagues within GSAP and across Columbia about how maybe we can uh, scale this up and make it a reality. So I will stop there. Uh, I just want to give you some different perspectives and obviously there will be lots of questions that people will have. And so uh, I'll stop my sharing. I will ask uh, the panelists to please turn on their cameras. And then I want to start with a, a, a few questions. Uh, so obviously today's discussion is just the beginning, right? And, and it's it's a very narrow slice of the discussion because we're within the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation right now. But there are these similar conversations that have been happening across Columbia and have been happening for some time. But uh, one of the things, if you, you've touched on this, but talk about it more broadly is, what are some of the real challenges? And certainly, uh, Ms. King, you brought up the issue of not wanting to be studied. And I, I really highlight the, po the part where you said, we're not a sandbox for experimentation, right? You're a living, breathing organism. You have real outcomes. You're working with real people and on a different timeline. Can you expand more on uh, what those challenges are and sort of what can be done in a different way? And certainly bringing the issue around funding and power, I think that's a, that's a really important point that you had made. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think uh, it's, a, it's a unique problem to have, right? So I, I've been speaking about uh, the potential of room to grow and it's almost like as you talk about it, as people hear about it, I think, you know, Malo, you were in the room um, that it's such a unique idea. No one is combining the services the way that we are. Um, it's one of the reasons why Columbia was interested in getting involved with the research. Um, it is, you know, you just kind of, well, eyes just, wide open. Um, and we, uh, you know, when it comes to academic institutions or top thought partners or journalists um, who, you know, want to dig in or work with us, uh, you know, it's important for us to remember uh, who we are. And we're still a small to medium organization. Um, and, uh, you know, we're also a nonprofit, right? And so we are just naturally designed to run lean. Um, and so some of the challenges include just capacity on the team, right? Uh, to be able to not only do their everyday job, funding for the, the organization, for the program, and then funding for uh, the study. Uh, you know, it's almost like you could hire a whole new person to do that. Those are some of the challenges that um, just are happen every day. Uh, I also, um, you know, I think about, uh, especially when it comes to the research, and this is a, probably a good challenge to have is, uh, you know, we are continually trying to improve our systems, uh, our program operations, um, you know, even HR. Uh, and uh, when you have a lot of suggestions and recommendations that you'd like to implement, uh, prioritizing them, uh, and then also realizing that you can't even really implement many program changes because you're in the middle of a randomized controlled trial. Um, and uh, there's, uh, I think, other external pressures uh, are there um, as well, including, okay, what's next for your work? Um, and where are you headed to? Are you expanding your reach? Um, uh, and so I, I, I hope that answers your question on some of the, the challenges that uh, we face. Uh, you know, I, I really do think you know, bringing uh, or taking on RCT is a huge undertaking um, period. Uh, and for a nonprofit, you know, it's something that we like to recommend, to be honest, because in order to get ready for one, you really just you got to have your stuff together. Um, but it is, you know, there is there is the management of the partnership and, and I and I say that in a good way because we are really partners in this work with Columbia that also takes time and energy uh, everything from check-ins to passing on uh, process evaluation data um, to designing surveys and questionnaires uh, together uh, and you know also that could be a whole other job uh, is a, a person on our team working with the Columbia team. Um, so uh, I think that was the first part of your, your question. I don't know if you want me to pause there. That was fantastic. Why don't, why don't we pause and I, I just want to bring Mr. Forbes into the conversation. So you highlighted obviously uh, you know what you're trying to do now. President Bollinger made his public comments on July 21st last summer 
uh, you've sprung into action. You are, you've been at the table for many of these conversations and helping to shape where, how, how Columbia moves forward. Can you talk about just some of the challenges it's been? You know, I, I think of myself as a researcher, uh, a professor, obviously, and more than that, obviously. But you know, there are, we have colleagues who say my job is to do research teaching, and I'll do my service, and I want to go home and, or go to the Hamptons for the summertime, and I've done my part because I've published my work in journals. How uh, have you broken down those silos in that way of thinking? And you know, if you could just talk a little bit about that, because I think those are some of the real challenges, and maybe any other challenges that you've come across that I didn't just ask you about. Right. Well, I, I think the, the first thing was that there was a, a charge to create something that's going to respond to the, uh, to the pandemic, to uh, racial injustice and, and, and that sort of thing. And so you know, we, we look internally at what do we do well? You know, we know that we are a, a, a world-class uh, academic institution but we also are a, uh, it's a workforce development engine. People, even if you're coming here to, to get a degree, you are in a place where you're going to leave and go to the workforce. So our intellectual capital, you know, is around science, technology, engineering, art, and math, plus entrepreneurship. So we started organizing around those spaces. We'd already been um, collaborating with various uh, parts of the university. But how we actually got into the community before, like with the community benefits agreement, it was about putting money uh, on the street, but not being present with regards to your, your know-how, uh, the capacity, the, you know, the, the, the team that you may uh, be able to bring forward. With, with this instance, we are actually organizing within the university, we have to educate ourselves about, okay, if we're going to respond, then we need to look at how we can respond and how do we actually get organized. And, you know, like I said, the, the, the silos are something that I think is a, uh, you know, it's a, a traditional setup at, at, at most universities. Like you said, you know, it's involved, everybody's involved in their independent uh, research uh, efforts. But how do we take that research, you know, into the community and actually organize around that. And so that's what we need to do internally in terms of, of, of bringing that together. Um, you know, the obstacles are probably uh, based on the fact that there hasn't been a conversation about it. There hasn't been education. You know, we haven't informed people. You know, like I, we've had conversations like about the community development corporations. Well, you know, one of the things in the research I've done in the past, I realized, sure, community development corporations were great for what they were set up to do. And they were primarily set up out of the 60s. And the, uh, I believe the original intent was in many instances, counterinsurgency. You know, they said, well, we're gonna have home ownership. Well, people don't burn down their own homes, you know? So it was a very interesting model to look at. And it was also one that was, always seriously underfunded. You know, at one time in New York City, there were 200 community development corporations. Now you have maybe a handful, you know. Uh, they were supported by foundations that only did um, uh, demonstration projects for three years. And so one of the things we realized is that we need to come, we need to go all in. You know, how do we put the full weight and force and the intellectual capital of the university behind something that can really impact the community. And so a lot of this in terms of the, the, the you know, like I said, the, the, there aren't obstacles. There are limits to the information that everybody has. And we have to give people information. We have to educate each other about how we can do this. You know, um, so, so, you know, so, so a lot of it has to deal with that. And, um, and I think that we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're we're moving forward. I, I I think that educating the community now is going to be is the next phase, and that's what's part of the feasibility study. It's a big part of that. Going to many of the major stakeholders in the community and educating them about this is what we want to do. Sure, we've been here in the past, but we haven't been participating the way we think we should now. You know, so so it's so, so it's a two way street in terms of how we're, um, you know, educating ourselves, 
and educating the community as to how we can participate in uh, helping the community. Mm -hmm. So I want to—I actually want to follow up on that and, and bring up the issue for both of you, uh, the issue of repair and healing. Uh, we know the long legacy of universities, and certainly as I talked in the opening, uh, Columbia, we also have our, our past sins, and, and you know, we will continue to make mistakes, and we have to address those things. But how do you uh, see the university being able to really move forward in the way that you've described, Mr. Forbes, and certainly the kind of work that you're doing, Ms. King, with your work at Room to Grow, without the repair and healing? What, what do you see needs to happen in order to kind of get to that place where communities will be willing to trust, the door, they, they feel embraced, and it's not just a top-down approach of Columbia, Columbia dangling money or Columbia expanding, or even in the case of, of, of me as a professor, right? I teach planning methods. Right. And part of the planning methods, students have to do an analysis on a neighborhood. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to partner with the community organization. It drives students crazy. Half like it, the other half it drives crazy because they say, we don't want to um, go in and be this, the continual problem of Columbia. And, I, and no matter how hard I try to explain to them and say, look, you might have a tool and specialization. You're not going in as the expert, you're going in to learn if people are willing to embrace that, right? And, but it's still this notion of we're Columbia and the rest is all separate as opposed to we're Columbia University in our full name in the city of New York, which is our full name, right? So sorry for the long question, but I just wanted to, to just highlight some of those uh, right. <laughs> intricate challenges, but, but especially around the repair and healing piece. And I know, this is just the beginning of many conversations that we're not always the right people to have that conversation with bringing other people to the table in future conversations that will be more, uh, that may just have a different perspective as well on that. Right, I, I think the, the, the um, you know, the asset, say that, look at the aspect of research, right? It was uh, Columbia researchers that along with information that was collected by formerly incarcerated uh, academics, uh, with regards to what was called the Seven, Neighbor seven Neighborhood Study, which showed that uh, seven neighborhoods in New York City make up 75% of the populations that are in state prisons, right? That's not seven neighborhoods in New York State, that's just in New York City, okay? So that research was used by people in GSAP, okay, to organize a, a project called the Million Dollar Blocks, collaborating with other people who were involved with that. So one of the things that we looked at, we said, okay, we need to be engaged in this because Harlem was one of the most heavily impacted communities for people returning from prison. So what can we do? Well, we have, we, we have resources. We can teach entrepreneurship. We can get involved in workforce development, right? But a lot of it has to do with opening up the university to the education opportunity. You know, the university, uh, you know, there's been on pause now. We, we teach in six different prisons, okay? We have some of the most, I think, innovative programs in our business school teaching formerly incarcerated people uh, entrepreneurship, coding. You know, we have other programs that say out of the School of Social Work, the Beyond the Bars Conference. It's actually probably the largest conference or event the university does outside of graduation and probably one of the largest events in the country that looks at the plight of the formerly incarcerated in the United States, okay? So we started building these relationships long before. So, and plus we don't send strangers into the community. You know, the, when I was an urban city planner for New York City, I, I lived in Harlem, okay? Uh, most of the people on my staff are very well versed in what's going on in Harlem and are familiar. And so that's the other, well, the other aspect of it is that you can't send strangers into the community. You know, you can't say, well, we can't find any qualified people who look like people in Harlem. Well, we know that that's not true. You know, so I think that that's been the kind of the foundation of a lot of the work that we're doing, you know, and we're striving on that. And so some of the people who are familiar with the community who are also involved, involved with the university internally are helping to educate the university about how we can best, you know, uh, move forward with these problems. But I think, you know, the issue of capacity building, you know, do you have the right people mm. that can do this work? Mm. You know, and we, you know, ever since, since like 2008, 
we have actually been building that internally. And a lot of it was, was focusing on the community benefits agreement. But I think now we, you know, we have, you know, it's like, like Mike Tyson says, right? Every time everybody gets in the ring, it has a plan until they get hit. Well, we've been hit, so we've had to pivot. And we're actually probably better prepared to pivot than we uh, believe we were um, when we first started out, say in 2008, in terms of this focus on the Harlem community. Thank you. And, and Ms. King, if you could follow up on this question of repair and healing from your perspective, and then we have a whole series of questions from the audience that I want to start engaging you on. Yeah, and I think Flores touched upon a couple of uh, thoughts that I have, but I mean, the first step is to acknowledge, right, that you've done harm and that repair is needed. Um, and, you know, that I know Columbia has taken steps and other institutions. I'm a Brown alum. I remember when we came forth uh, with our study on the history of slavery on campus um, and, you know, really just, just getting that out there. And I, I've found even in my own work at Room to Grow that it's one thing to let people in, uh, into your community, into your rooms, um, but I've also found that it's important to venture out um, and really uh, establishing and committing to the community uh, and showing up to what's important to them. And so I think about uh, you know, we just opened a site in the South Bronx uh, last fall. Um, and although a majority of our families would commute from the South Bronx to Manhattan, um, and it is something that we've been talking about for a while, we I realized we really didn't know the South Bronx well, and they didn't know us. Uh, and so what would it take to establish trust? And it wasn't about inviting them to open houses and selling room to grow as much as it was for me and my team to show up to the community board meetings and showing them support, listening to what really matters to the entire community um, and not necessarily pushing your agenda, but you know, genuinely and authentically becoming a fabric of that community. Um, and I think that that is something that uh, you know, Columbia, you know, can offer uh, not just in, in Harlem, but the, you know, the whole city. Um, and, you know, once there's kind of that trust uh, you know, you, and you'll be invited to the barbecue, as, as they I say, or, or we hope. Um, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, this concept of just walking the walk is so simple. Um, but uh, doing that with humility is really, really important. Um, and, uh, you know, to Flores's point, you know, making, you know, there's no excuse, <laughs> you know, you know, if you, you know, you can bring in program graduates to help in this work who are from the Bronx. That's one thing that we've done is establish an advisory council. The people are there who know the community, who know the priorities, um, who can not only advise you, uh, but can lead uh, in the work uh, with us. Um, and so those are just some of my thoughts. Well, thank you very much. Let's turn to some of the participants' questions in the audience. Uh, a question for you, Mr. Forbes. Can you please talk more about the way that Columbia is currently reframing its relationship with the West Harlem community, especially in light of the Manhattanville campus expansion and the community benefits agreement that the university signed? Oh, you're on mute. Uh... Okay, so you know the, the work that we're, um, th that I just was talking about is a, it's, it's about race. You know, so you know, let's let's be let's let's be frank about what's what's happening here. That's about race. What we're talking about in terms of what we can do to uh, organize intellectual capital to help the Harlem community of African Americans, Afro Latinos, the Community Benefits Agreement, which was one of the reasons why I was I was recruited to come to Columbia, is part of a uh, an expansive urban planning project where the university was in need of space. And we had to go through two public approval processes, the uniform land use review procedure in terms of ULER, in terms of changing the zoning. And because we, we, we had a desire to expand and, and the area was declared a blight. So we had to go through the general project plan through the uh, state. And so um, the benefits package kind of came out of that and was focusing on that particular real estate transaction. Now, our focus is not just 
on West Harlem. We're talking about uh, Harlem and um, Washington Heights inward. You know, so I think that those are some of the things that we're expanding on. And like I said, the one, you know, the work I'm talking about now, and, and I'm involved in all aspects of the work, whether it's the community benefits agreement, you know, the Manhattan Bill expansion, and what we're talking now with regards to the surrounding communities. And so I think that, you know, we, I, I think we have the bandwidth and the capacity to do it all, you know. So, so we're not really reframing the uh, conversation we're actually expanding, you know, the discussion to be a little more inclusive. You know, I think it's just really important because it's more comprehensive. You know, it's, it's economic development, it's affordable housing, it's entrepreneurship, it's workforce, it's criminal justice change, which is a really important aspect of this because of the, the number of people who make up the population that are impacted by the criminal justice system and the work that we can do to help bring them in to a to, to develop their whole as to help them reintegrate into society, and so these are some of the things that we're we're looking to do with regards to that. Thank you very much. So there's another question that says, "Hello, thank you for presenting. Would you have any suggestions for how other cities can participate in the work, or how cities could help each other?" I'm coming out of Cleveland, Ohio, and like to would like this work, uh, and these thought processes here and wondering how to get involved with these initiatives from, from Cleveland. Thank you for the presentation. So um, I, I, I will answer that as well. And I think uh, Ms. King, you can answer that maybe with room to grow. And I don't know if you have any expansion plans. And then maybe uh, Mr. Forbes, if, if you feel like it, you could uh, maybe think about it from a, other universities, but they might, how they might approach this work. So, so with the work I do, I, everything I try to do is, is based on real relationships, organic relationships. So I'm always open to work other places as long as I have a real partner on the ground, right? It's very difficult to just do drive-by research or just to drop in in a particular place, but to have a real connection. Now, I happen to uh, actually really love Cleveland, Ohio. I've been there uh, to give talks, I have know lots of other people who work in the planning agencies and do great work there. So it's a city that is doing wonderful things. I always joke and say, uh, you know, many of my students who live in Brooklyn, they should think about living in a wonderful place like Cleveland. You have those waterfront developments and people are riding their bikes and so forth. So I'm always open, but my, my philosophy has always been, how do you build real um, organic partnerships? Where can I add some value to what I'm trying to do? If not, then I'm always happy to just share the research that I'm doing. But if it's a real world project, it, I, I always think it has to be replicable. It has to be applicable. Um, it has to be scalable, right? So that other people could do it uh, or engage in that or certainly share those lessons learned. So with this partnership for social mobility that I talked about with uh, Johnson's, uh, Johnson C. C. Uh, uh, Smith University, as well as uh, uh, Penn and Columbia. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, I'm doing too many things at once. Uh, we really are trying to first focus on Charlotte and then uh, branch out, uh, you know, at, from Philadelphia, New York, and then think about other cities. But right now, those are the three cities that we're primarily uh, focusing on. So I don't know, Akila or Ms. King, if you want to talk about that as well. Uh, yeah, right now, uh, if I haven't stated, uh, Room to Grow is also in Boston. So we're a two city organization and it is my vision that uh, we branch out to a third, but uh, a key word that Mallow just brought up is sustainability. And so until we do that, we need to make sure that we can handle uh, our work on the ground now. Um, and, you know, if, the whole inventory side of our operations is, uh, you know, one of the biggest barriers. I'm uh, making sure that we can ensure the same dosage when it comes to material items as well as in the coaching work. Um, but, uh, you know, we will, when the time comes, embark on a location analysis. And, uh, you know, if Ohio is on the list, uh, you know, we'll, we can circle back. Um, but, you know, I think there are some other Midwest cities as well as some other East Coast cities and some Southern cities too on that short list. And if I could just do a plug for the work, those of, you know, people in other places that are interested in the kind of work that Room to Grow does, I mean, it's a great model. Um, and really with the, the parental coaching, the material support, as well as the community connection, it's one of the few programs that, I'm, that I know of and certainly other colleagues at Columbia have searched high and low that does this, all three. So some do one or the other or maybe two, but they do all three. So why don't we uh, uh, move forward a bit? So there was a question that has disappeared, but it was for Mr. Forbes to talk about 
the efforts around small business development uh, that Columbia is trying to do and the work that you're involved in, because we know that with the global pandemic, certainly in New York City, small businesses, businesses of color have been hit uh, very hard. And certainly we know uh, Harlem businesses have suffered. So there was a question about small business support in the work that you're doing. Right. I, I think we've been probably, like I said, that's probably one of our strongest uh, areas uh, with Columbia Business School as a uh, university partner. We have the Columbia Harlem Small Business Development Center, which is one of the top uh, SBDCs in the state out of 25. We're usually ranked either number one or two. And, and, and it involves uh, a staff of professionals and also involves the uh, academics there with regards to our education training programs. And, but I think that we're looking at, that's, that's the economic base of Harlem is small businesses. You know, uh, yes, there are, the, Columbia is one of the, is, we're the largest employer in, in Harlem. Okay, but most of the vitality of the community is, in, uh, is with small businesses. You know, Harlem used to be a heavily uh, trafficked place with regards to hospitality with restaurants and jazz clubs and things of that nature. So all of that is coming back. You know, there's a, uh, there are hotels being built in upper Manhattan. So, so I think that one of the things we need to do is to be able to, so how do we take what we can do and provide that uh, in many ways, like a consultant to provide these services to these small businesses. And it's been growing and growing over the years. And I think it's, 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 a, uh, it's a really important effort. Uh, we kind of doubled down on that uh, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, we hadn't been involved with providing loans to small businesses. Now we're doing that. Uh, we think we have a very innovative approach. And, you know, and I think that we're involved with training, you know, entrepreneurship as with regards to individuals and that sort of thing. So I think we're building, you know, trying to, to manif you know, trying to maintain the economic base of this community, you know, especially in this, you know, it's really, really a serious period, uh, the way the uh, pandemic has impacted the community here. Thank you for that. So we have a, we have a wonderful question from one of our alums, Jennifer Sun, who also is a leader of a New York City community development organization. So much of what we've been discussing so uh, Ms. Sun has asked, how are research projects building into their, their process, the case making to funders for the organizational capacity building that is critical for nonprofit partners to successfully operationalize strategy and program change? So I can start with that. And then uh, Ms. King, if you wanna jump in and certainly uh, Mr. Forbes. So everything I try to do that actually does involve community partners, they have to be written into the, any kind of grants, right? So oftentimes, the old model has been, oh, as a researcher, you then want to go to a community and say, well, can you give me your time for free? Can I poke around your, your organization for free? And I think anytime you're thinking about a, a, a real research project, certainly, uh, you know, uh, with equal partners, I think Ms. King said it best earlier, is that funding and the power dynamics around funding is in, incredibly important. And I think you also said, uh, Ms. King, that it can shape uh, kind of how the organization might think about going forward because of the funding's at the table, right? Whether that's, you might go down a road that you otherwise wouldn't have gone. So with the, the grants I've submitted, uh, certainly uh, I've thought about the capacity component. It's a, it's a big one. And organizations are businesses, right? And so they are always uh, have to run efficiently. They have staff. They, they oftentimes are understaffed, right? Uh, often, so these are all major challenges. So I'll stop there. But Ms. King, if you want to talk about yeah, I really like this question because if I uh, if we were to embark on a you know a second cohort or do this all over again, you know I think this is something really to consider. You know, most of the you know researchers right they they know what they need. This is not their first rodeo, so written into budgets are postdocs or additional support needed for specific projects. And when it comes to submitting and writing for grants, yes, we do incorporate a portion of. Uh, portion covering my salary or maybe some other team members' salaries, but we have not written in, you know, what does it look like for us to have a temporary person on our team to support in the research? You know, and traditionally a lot of funders are really focusing on the work on the ground, um, supporting general operations. And, you know, I do think that there are some fantastic research partners, uh, sorry, funders who would understand uh, the need for this, but also some could see this as a nice to have. So, you know, I think, you know, there's no real roadmap for a nonprofit entering 
entering into an RCT. Um, and I think, you know, if I had to give advice to future nonprofits, yes, get ahead of this, right? Whether it's a new hire, write in for funding. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's something for me to absolutely keep in mind in the future, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, additional funding for just general, uh, for general, general capacity building at, at room to grow, uh, you know, that is more of the traditional grant writing that we do. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, um, I worked in a, uh, project, uh, called the comprehensive community revitalization program in the, um, it was around the kind of mid to late nineties. And one of the things that it showcased was capacity building. And the Acerna Foundation um, under the leadership of uh, Anita Miller, who is one of the first uh, women program officers at the Ford Foundation, she realized that, you know, in order for community development to be successful, you need to have capacity. And capacity actually is people, hiring the best people you can, to have them on the ground to actually do the work. So they supported with a lot of other efforts, you know, with terms of research, terms of technical assistance. But we use, I guess, as the, uh, the foundation for the project, there were six community development corporations in the South Bronx that participated, uh, you know, like Mid Bronx Desperados, and, and there were a few others. And, um, you know, and I thought that this was a very, it was very innovative because uh, up until that point, and it even at times today, foundations don't support staff. You know, they want to be program specific and very, you know, few are, are um, you know, do the general operations. And so I, I think it's really important. You know, I think that's one of the things that's helped us here at Columbia. Okay, we can get involved in efforts where we actually do have the capacity to do many things. So I can go around to different departments and meet with some of the, the uh, academics who are doing research in that space and you can get them to participate. You know? And so I think that these are some of the things that we need to look at with regards to getting foundations to underwrite these efforts and foundations, they should look back at that. You know, there was a report done you know, that focused on the capacity building efforts Unfortunately, it was again, one of those three year demonstration projects, you know, which I think are, it's, it's really problematic with regards to uh, foundation funding, you know, in terms of them being in for the long haul, because we're, you, you know, you do a three year, three year demonstration project for a community that's been depressed, oppressed and devastated for centuries. You know, so I think it's really difficult in order to make that happen, but the capacity building aspect of it you know, in terms of having personnel, the best personnel that you can find is, is probably really key to a lot of that. All right, we've got lots of questions. So in 15 minutes left as usual, so we'll have to definitely have to have another a part two to this, but there's a question from the West Coast that says, thank you so much for this enlightening panel. I'm a faculty in the college, uh, California College of the Arts in San Francisco. I'm interested in introducing community partnership and developing design studios. Looking back at your experience with partnerships, both from uh, the side of academic institutions and the community, what could be some structures and protocols to be implemented in forming these partnerships, such as CBAs, to help both the community and the academic partner to ensure a tangible, positive contribution to the community and to reduce the burden on the community in promoting this partnership? Well, that is an excellent question. Um, I, can, <laughs> I can start with that and then if others wanna jump in. You know, I, I've, I've taught studio for a number of years, both uh, at uh, UC Berkeley and also at Columbia. And I would say that when I look back on the, you know, 10 plus years of teaching studio, what were the most successful studios? Without a doubt, it's with having a real community partner that is one of the co-instructors with you. Um, there was a case in East Oakland. I've been, I was able to work with the, uh, an organization and it wasn't like we normally talk about as a client. I actually don't like the term of referring to partners as the client uh, or people that were, you know, it it's, should be more of what's the, a real partnership. And so um, I was able to work uh, with this particular organization in East Oakland that works with youth really around violence and, 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 and entrepreneurship and so forth. And by building that trust and understanding that the director or the leader of that organization was very much um, a partner with me in this, 
it just changed the whole dynamic. Not to say that there still weren't power dynamics with, between the university and, and this organization, there were. Uh, there are different cultures and perspectives. And so one of the things we did right away was sit down and come up with an agreement with who would do what, what the expectations were, and try to involve uh, young people as researchers and part of the studio as well, right? And so it's very difficult the way oftentimes classes are structured within universities, as you know, as a faculty member yourself, uh, but you, you have to think outside of the box there. And in a, in a more recent studio that I've taught at Columbia University in Chile, one of our alums who's back in Chile doing the work around uh, natural disasters, or it's like it's nothing natural about the disasters today, but disaster management recovery, uh, she was a co-instructor with me. And you know, it was very clear that I had a certain level of, of expertise and knowledge, or would even call it uh, expertise more like skill set. And she really had that local knowledge, right? Much of what Ms. King had talked about and I think Mr. Forbes has touched on. And so I very much was an outsider and I was very honest about that and, and tried to learn. And so that was a much more uh, productive and, and helpful studio. So I do think the agreements are, agreements are important, whether you go as far as creating a community benefits agreement, uh, you know, it's up to you, but it's it, at the end of the day, it's how do you hold people accountable? How do we hold the universities and the faculty accountable? And how do we hold our community partners accountable if we agree to uh, engage either around a studio or a community project or some other um, process? So I, I, I'm sorry that this is something we could talk about forever. So let me turn it over to Ms. King and Mr. Forbes. I'm not sure I have anything else to add, um, Mala. You know, I, I think that the only thing is, you know, ensuring that you're mission aligned and you are you are aligned in your work, right? Everything else I talked about in our slide, the, the being an equal partner is just crucial. Um, and uh, I also think not being afraid to, to disagree and to engage in discourse. Uh, and, you know, that comes when you have a trusting relationship, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, everything Mallow said was, was spot on. Why didn't I, oh, go ahead, Mr. Forbes, sorry. You know, I, I think for, for me, one of the most successful uh, operations, similar to what you're talking about, was at GSAP um, several years ago. It was called the Urban Technical Assistance Project. And it was run by an urban planning professor named Lionel McIntyre. And what he did is he, he worked at it in different, different ways. It was a, a, a studio that educated students. And it was also like a consulting operation where they were also the employees doing work. And he did urban design projects, urban planning projects in the community. Uh, I actually, he, helped, he worked with me on one of the more successful uh, projects in Harlem when I was a city planner, uh, the Freddie Douglas Boulevard Initiative. And he probably worked on several others in that community. And he was somebody who had worked in the Harlem community, was well known, was a professor at, at GSAP. Uh, students were actually recruited from an HBCU uh, in Dillard. And there was a 3-2 program. They did three, three years at Dillard two at Columbia, they graduated with a BA and a, a master's degree in urban planning. And, um, and I think that they, they, you know, they brought real value to that relationship, you know? So I, so I think that that's, that's a model uh, that I think uh, people could actually look at. And, um, you know, that, that, that combined the studio with the actual consultant operation with the academy and the actual doing work in the community. Mm -hmm. So, so tied to that, and I think, you know, in the last nine minutes that we have, we, we really want to focus on the role of the university, right? We know uh, there are many different functions of a university, but one of the questions we have is, is squarely that says, do you think that Columbia's role in this is mainly to conduct research in order to know whose resources should, in order to know where resources should be directed? Are there ways for students to get more involved uh, in the work that direct, uh, that offers direct aid and resources to surrounding communities? How do students overcome issues of trust that these communities have with their institution when they are, when they are only in school for a few years? Thank you all for your thoughts and presentations. So the question that this, uh, the question that we've got is very much about the role of the student and also about the role of resources within the university and the role of the university. So uh, 
Can you two talk about that? I think it's an excellent question. Okay, I'll, I'll start off. Yeah, I, I think that the uh, students, um, you know, like I was talking about with the UTAP operation, the students were heavily involved in uh, doing work in the community while at the same time getting their education. Um, a lot of times I'm not so sure you want to, as um, uh, Ms. King said, you know, to be a sandbox for uh, experimentation and research. I, I, I think that we have to be careful about saying that we're doing this and we're collecting data. A lot of times, say for example, with the small business work, the technical assistance we do, it's about helping someone. You know, it's not about, well, we're exploring this so we can come up with a better way in terms of doing this, you know, or, you know, even with regards to um, the work, the criminal justice change work, you know, I think it's about helping people. It's not about saying, well, this process came together to help someone. So therefore, I'm going to go write it, do some research and write a book about it, you know, and come up with this manual. You know, so I, so I think that a lot of times that I mean, even somebody who's I mean, I've, I've done research and I've, I've published, I think uh, it has its place. But I think that when you're working with a community that's suspicious of you and you haven't treated them fairly in the past, even though it wasn't you, but it was the institution, uh, I, I think you need to be uh, cognizant of what it is you're doing. You know, are you working to really help people? or are they just uh, a sandbox for experimentation? Yeah, I think that that's spot on. And it's something that very much weighs on me too in Room to Grow because we are equal partnerships in this research. What are we gonna do with our findings, right? Are we really committed to not only modifying our program model, but taking it to you know the capital and really uh, fighting for policy change, right? Um, and, you know, that is our hope. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's a big commitment, right? And like I said, going back to our capacity, are we really capable of that? And that's where I think we will be leaning on our, our partners at Columbia to help us really see this through um, and making sure that um, the research wasn't done in vain. It wasn't just for a manuscript and some publications, um, that it is really about coming back uh, to the community. Um, and, you know, I love this question around students too, because, uh, you know, you're, you're here on this panel and you're questioning, you know, what can you do to really get involved, but could you be causing more harm yourself, um, which is uh, really self-reflective. Um, you know, my suggestion really is, you know, find a community organization in New York, if you're at Columbia, that, you know, that really speaks to who you are what your interests are and get involved genuinely just as a human being, right? And this is kind of the same speech that I tell many youths, uh, but you know, if you find something that's authentic and genuine, that organization is gonna accept you as part of the family. And then naturally you can get more involved, uh, whether it's joining uh, you know, a junior board or a board of getting involved in some evaluation work. Like I said, we're running lean. We're really looking for um, you know, supporters and volunteers uh, who um, really are invested in our work and moving us forward. Um, and so, you know, if you can then get Columbia involved, great. But, you know, I think, think about uh, just philanthropy in your own life. Wow, that was so well said. And I know um, that obviously the students that we have in our program are absolutely fantastic across all of GSAP and are thinking about these broader issues that we're all dealing with. And so, um, I'm sure that your words today have been so helpful in them thinking about how they move forward. Um, and don't be shy in letting us know if there are opportunities as you just laid out, to, to certainly to volunteer or Mr. Forbes get involved with your work, uh, because I'm sure many of the, the students that are uh, participating today would, would love to get involved, as well as the alumni. I mean, one of the things that we would like to do is really break down these barriers that I talked about earlier and to be uh, it, bi-directional in terms of us learning as faculty, students, and staff from community, bringing community members to Columbia to be a part of that co-production of knowledge that takes place, as well as us being able to go and be invited as uh, and welcomed um, into communities that hopefully we are already a part of, right? And so I do appreciate that. Uh, we only have a few more minutes, but I just wanted to know, given this, you know, your reflections on this point of time that we're in, certainly, uh, 
all of us have highlighted kind of the, the time that we're living in and there's an opportunity to do something different. In your own work, thinking about this conversation, is there any things that you are hopeful for that you, you want to just some reflections that you might have as we go forward? Uh, I'm just encouraged that, you know, Columbia is having these conversations, right? And it's not just in, in this forum, uh, but uh, recently with Columbia World Projects and our researchers, you know, starting to really go for it. Uh, and um, I think that that is promising. Um, and I think for me, I'm just looking forward to doing more with our communities. Um, how could we get them involved in these, in these projects and the research? Exciting subjects. Thank you very much, Mr. Forbes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged. You know, um, I, I know that to many people, Columbia uh, has a bad reputation, mm. but of not what caring for the community, of of being the uh, the 800-pound gorilla. You know, I, I use that better uh, symbol instead of the elephant because the gorilla is actually uh, swinging around and moving from place to place. You know, but like I said, I'm, I'm more encouraged because I know Columbia is a, has, has an international focus. And when I started hearing academics saying, what, what about three blocks away? You know, I was really more encouraged there. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, because of what we're doing with regards to the surrounding communities, uh, the conversations that we're having internally about uh, how can we do better and, uh, and knowing that we can, you yeah. know, I, I think that that's, that's very encouraging. You know. Well, I have to say thank you both for such an engaging and thoughtful conversation. I know it's not always an easy one, and you, and you two are both very busy people. So uh, on behalf of Dean Andraus and the student body and my colleagues at Columbia within GSAP and more broadly, I want to thank you for participating today. And I would say that, you know, I, I like that I like the words that you've offered in terms of what may happen next. And, you know, as we think about the role of the university in the 21st century, there's a lot more that we can do, really die, tying into what Bollinger has laid um, out around the fourth purpose of really thinking about ethics and partnership and collaboration. And how do we do this uh, in a more thoughtful and effective way where our work doesn't just sit in a journal or you know we're in our silos, but actually leveraging all of our alumni all of the resources that the university brings to the table, all of our students, all of our staff, all of our friends from around the world to really try to bring about the kind of change that we all want to see. So on behalf of uh, uh, GSAP and Columbia University, I want to thank you all for participating. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but we look forward to having more conversations like that in the near future. Thank you very much. <laughs>